Springbok Titan Peter Steph de Toy has been named World Rugby's Player of the Year. And quite frankly, no one is more deserving than this hero of Springbok Rugby. Peter Steph de Toy, the Malmesbury Missile, is a man who epitomizes grit, determination and brilliance. And in this episode, you are going to get a front row seat as I break down how it is that Peter Steph de Toy has gone from being a Springbok debutant almost a decade ago to the best player in the world for the second time in his career. Let's not forget that a few years ago de Toy was actually on the verge of retirement. He had a hematoma that developed into an extremely rare condition called acute compartment syndrome, which basically means that the tissue in his injured muscle has swollen to the point where it was blocking the blood supply to the rest of the limb. At that point, only 43 previous cases had been documented in medical literature, and almost half of those had ended in amputation. Over the years, he has suffered other injuries as well. He's had surgeries on both ankles, a cracked sternum, and two anterior cruciate ligament injuries. The second of which required his father to donate a piece of his own hamstring tendon so his son could play again. This is warrior stuff. And if you look at his play, I genuinely wonder sometimes if this man actually secretly has two hearts. Now let's go back to the moment when he first burst onto the scene. You might remember seeing him playing for Western Province, but before that he was playing at the Sharks. Now he's originally from the Cape, that's why he's called the Malmesbury Missile. If you're not familiar with the geography, Malmesbury is a town, it's about 50 or so kilometers north of Cape Town, up along the N7 highway. Now, Peter Steff moved to the Sharks as a lock. That's where he made his name. That's how he managed to get into the Springbok side. In 2013, he made his debut on the end of year tour to Wales. But then, Rugby World Cup 2015 was one of those key moments in his career. So, just before we were about to play Japan in our opening match of the tournament, well, Skulk Berger suffered an injury on the eve of the match. Now, initially, Berger and Francois Lowe were named as our two flanks for that match, and Sia Colisi was on the bench. So was Peter Steff de Toy. And what Heineke Meyer, our coach at the time, decided to do was to promote Peter Steff de Toy to the number seven jersey, blindside flank in South Africa ahead of Khaleesi. Now, I'm going to tell you guys that at the time, I, like many others, felt that that was something of a slap in the face to Sia. Now, Sia himself was a fairly new player at that stage. He also, like Peter Steff, had made his debut in 2013, but that was earlier in the year at home against Scotland. But I think that the contention came from the fact that Sia Khaleesi at that stage was a flank, and Peter Steff de Toy at that stage was a lock. And the question was, why would you take a man who is on your bench as a lock and promote him to flank when you already have a flank on the bench? And I don't forget that at the time, Heineke May was under pressure. The Springboks had lost a few games in a row. We had also lost to Argentina for the first time in our history. And something else that Mayer was under pressure for was a perceived lack of transformation in the Springbok team. So you can understand how... It didn't look good either. A white player gets injured and you've got a black player in the same position on the bench and you don't put him on the field. You take a white player who is not in that position and you put him in. So it wasn't a good look for Mayer at all. Now, if we're fair, I thought Peter Steff actually had a fairly good game against Japan. Not man of the match stuff, but he performed admirably. He performed adequately. OK, so nothing against Peter Steff. And as I say, the contention and the pressure was really on Mayer. And why would you do what he did? Nevertheless, Peter Steff was back at lock the following year under coach, in fact, the following matches uh, of that World Cup, and then again the following year under Alistair Kutsia. And then, of course, as we know, Rassi Erasmus returned to South Africa in 2018. He made Sia his captain. There's a little bit of irony in all of that, really. And uh, Peter Steff de Toy was selected as the blindside flank. Now, I think by that stage, we had kind of got used to the idea of Peter Steff 
playing there from time to time. And also no one was really questioning Rassi either because we were at such a low point in our rugby. 57-0 against the All Blacks, 38-3 against Ireland, 57-15 against New Zealand. First ever defeat to Italy, things like that. So Rassi had a lot of credit in the bank. And so selecting Peter Steff at seven at that stage was like, okay, we kind of think he's more of a lock, but... We'll, we'll go with it. Let's see what Rassi is trying to do here. And Peter Steff de Toy would subsequently win the World Rugby Player of the Year award. And he's now done it for the second time. This man is heroic. He is courageous. He never, ever stops. It's like Energizer Bunny battery stuff, isn't it? He just does not stop. That's why I say I think he has two hearts. And who can forget his performance at the Rugby World Cup final last year, 2023, where he harassed the All Blacks, making 28 tackles in that final. Jordy Barrett is a man who will know all about the Peter Steff du Toy effect. Now, as much as we're waxing lyrical about Peter Steff, let me also add, I think I mentioned it earlier, and it's worth saying again, it is the second time that he has won the World Player of the Year award. It means he is the only Springbok to ever win the award twice. The only other South Africans to have won it was Skulk Berger and Brian Habana, and that was in the Jake White era. So really special what's going on here with Peter Steff de Toy. We celebrate him. We love him. He is our man. And just for the record, Eben Etzebet and Cheslin Colby were among the other nominees for the award. And I think it's fair to say that had they won, we would have been very happy with that outcome as well. They would have been worthy winners of this award to boot. The other nominee for the award was Ireland's captain, Caelan Doris. Now, that was not the only award that was handed out in Monaco on Sunday night. World Rugby also named their team of the year. Let's have a look what that looks like. And if you're a Springbok supporter, it certainly looks very, very nice indeed. Guys, seven Springboks have been named in this World Team of the Year. I'm not sure one team has ever contributed that many players in a Team of the Year before. Quite unbelievable. It truly is. So let's have a look at that team starting in the front row. Unsurprisingly, Oxen Chair is our man in the loose head jersey. Malcolm Marks taking the number two jersey. And then Tyrell Lomax, the All Black, is our tight head. Eben Etzebet, he's there. As is Tide Byrne of Ireland. There's the first Irishman completing the tight five. Pablo Matera, my favourite Argentine player at the moment. He represents Los Pumas, only player in the team of the year. He's there. And then obviously Peter Steff de Toy is on the other side of the scrum. And we have Jameson Gibson Park. He is at nine with Damien McKenzie at Flyhoff. That I won't lie, that that seemed a little bit of a strange one. Uh, in fact, you know what? Now that I remember, I forgot to tell you, our eighth man, Caelan Doris, uh, also of Ireland. So three Irishmen making the world team of the year. Uh, let's go back to the back line in the centres, Damien Dialendi and Jesse Creel. I mean, who else was it going to be, right? And then on the wings, James Lowe of Ireland. So that's actually a fourth Irishman. Cheson Colby is the other wing with Will Jordan at fullback. Now, something else that will be of interest from a Springbok point of view is that Sasha Feinberg and Gourmet Zulu was one of the nominees for World Rugby's Young Player of the Year or as they call it, the breakthrough player of the year. I think if Sasha had not suffered that injury in the middle of the rugby championship and had gone on, then maybe I think he would have been in better contention. There's always that thing of recency bias, and I think Wallace Sititi has had a very, very good end-of-year tour for the All Blacks. Not that he didn't play well in the rugby championship, so he is the man winning the breakthrough player of the year. And I know that you are going to want to know who the coach of the year is, well, it should be Rassi Rasmus, right? Rassi won the Rugby Championship, the Qatar Airways Cup, the Mandela Plate, the Freedom Cup, won 11 out of 13 this year. We're world number one. And World Rugby, in their wisdom, decided that Rassi's achievements were not sufficient to be named World Coach of the Year. Instead, France's Jerome Darrett won the award. Jerome Darrett is their sevens coach, so I suppose winning the Rugby Sevens gold medal at the Olympic Games trumps all of those achievements on the part of Rassi. But then I suppose you and I both know that there's this bias towards France and Antoine Dupont, who supposedly is the greatest player of all time. 
I mean, I'm not even sure he's the greatest scrum off of all time. I just go back to the guys that I watched growing up. Joost van der Westezen, Nick Farr-Jones, George Gregan, Justin Marshall. Is Dupont, I mean, I'm not saying that Dupont is not a great player. I think we all agree that he is a great player. But is he that phenomenal that you would just dismiss Joost and George Gregan and Justin Marshall, Nick Farr-Jones, and say, ah, those guys, they're nothing compared to Antoine Dupont? I don't think so. Nevertheless... They had to, of course, give their man god an award, and duly he did win one, the Sevens Rugby Player of the Year. But Dupont did not make the Fifteens Team of the Year, which I suppose is a justifiable decision, but with these guys, you never quite know, hey? It wouldn't have surprised me one bit if he did make his way into that nine jersey in the team of the year, but in the end, it was Gibson Park of Ireland. So tell me, what do you think about the team of the year? What do you think about Peter Steph de Toy? What's your opinion on World Rugby's Player of the Year? Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you've enjoyed this content, maybe you'd like to support me. Guys, I would love to do this on a permanent basis and go to Australia in 2027 and cover the Rugby World Cup for you from down under with daily content. In order to make that happen, I'm going to need a little bit of funding. So if you are willing, I would be very, very appreciative if you'd head on over to my Patreon page and sign up as a patron. It starts from as little as $5 per month. The link is in the description area below. And if you're not yet ready to help me out with a bit of money you know what you can do you can crock roll the like button that helps the youtube algorithm tell other people that this is a good channel to be watching and you can also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so now peter steph de toy one of the greatest flanks in the history of springbok and world rugby and other great Springbok heroes that have worn the number six and seven jersey include the likes of Andre Fenter. I've done an exclusive interview with him. That is appearing on your screen right over here. Click on that. Go and watch it. Enjoy it. And maybe if you don't want to watch that one or if you already have, how about Corne Kricher? Both men telling me in depth about their colorful Springbok careers. Go there. Enjoy it. And I look forward to your company in the next episode.